Hey, welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. Oh, that's gonna be marked. Welcome to NASA EDGE. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're at the Johns Hopkins University. Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland. Getting a sneak peek behind the... Radiation Belt Storm Probe Mission. Very good. Or, or unofficially, Magnetospherance 1 and 2. You're looking pretty tall today. What's... Well, it is a new year, and as you know, I've vowed to be taller this year. <laughs> For 2011, I'm doing all my interviews sitting down. Because I've noticed that you can't tell how much taller the other person is when we're sitting down. So I figure instead of feeling inferior all the time, interviewing all these people that are over five foot four and a half, uh, sit them down and then we're on equal playing field. <laughs> or when I can, use platforms or chairs as we're going to, when I interview Nikki Fox, I will be using chairs. It'll be fun. Now, why are you dressed up in the uh, clean room garb? Well, Chris, as you know, with hard work and diligence, you right. have unique opportunities. And I did the legwork to get into the clean room. This is pretty tight security here. How'd you, how'd you get permission to do that? You gotta know the right people. You gotta fill out the right forms and do the hard work to get into the unique places. Well, I tell you what, you go interview Nikki Fox in the clean room and I'll talk with Jim Stratton, who's the mission systems engineer. And I'll see you on the other side. Okay. Outside of the clean room. All right. Uh, Nikki, I'm a little concerned. I I've noticed uh, that you're in your street clothes and I'm afraid you might be jeopardizing the integrity of this incredible mission. So what gives? Well, Blair, if we were actually in the clean room on the other side of this window, then you would need to be dressed like that. But, we're, you know, we only let the important people that know what they're doing on that side. So you can just relax because... You don't need to be wearing all that stuff. No, I knew that. Okay. But this is more of a fashion statement. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I thought you'd make a similar one, but uh, we'll just go with it as is. Okay. Uh, we're talking about a very important mission. And I, I wanted to talk about the unofficial name, if you don't mind. I like to call the, the two uh, satellites the Magnetospherance 1 and Magnetospherance 2. Have you thought about changing the name for us? No. Actually, we like radiation belt storm probes. We are RBSP, and we love it. Great. Well, why don't you tell us, look, Everything I've read about this mission says you're taking these probes and you're dropping them in the hostile environment of the radiation belt. Why is this necessary to understand space weather? Okay, well, as you say, we are putting them in the worst possible environment around the Earth. We're putting them in the region of space that most spacecraft try to avoid. And the reason that we're doing that is because we need to really understand these regions so that when other spacecraft do have to go through them, we can protect them better. Most instruments actually turn off when they go through the, the radiation belts. We have to be taking data. So we have to build these really, really well-protected, well-shielded spacecraft. And that has a lot of impacts for space weather, as you say. The radiation belts are part of our infrastructure. We live and we work in them. And we have to understand them so we can better predict their effect on the Earth. We mostly have a tank around it to protect them. We have uh, the luxury on RBSP that we have extra mass, basically. The launch vehicle that we're flying on, the Atlas V, has more capability than we need for the spacecraft that we built. And so we were able to put some very large, heavy boxes on there that protect us from a lot of that radiation. If we have filters basically on the inputs to all of our electronic circuits so that if radiation comes through a wire and changes a zero to a one, for example, our electronics are smart enough to ignore that. So the data that we'll be bringing back will be telling us how these radiation belts change in response to everything that comes from the sun. The sun sends energy our way, we absorb it, and our planet responds. So the radiation belts can pump up and become very big and very hostile. They can go very small and become quiet. The same processes that cause those radiation belt changes are powering the aurora that you see overhead that can cause issues for power grids and various other things here on Earth, problems with GPS. Okay, so with, with magnetospherence one and two, what kind of instruments are you gonna place on those? Well, RBSP A and B are identical spacecraft and they have identical payloads of, of instruments. And we have a full suite of particle instruments. So we're gonna be taking measurements from very, very low energy plasmas right up to the incredibly high giga electron volt protons that you see mostly in the inner belt. 
Um, in addition to that, we have a full fields and waves suite. So we're going to be looking at magnetic fields, electric fields, and all the waves that are associated with those. You can do very different science when the spacecraft are close together and when they're further apart. So for example, if you have one spacecraft going through an event, you can't, really can't tell much about it if you don't come back for another nine hours. You don't know whether it's changing in time, whether it's getting bigger, how it's, how it's really changing. The second spacecraft coming through fairly quickly afterwards can tell you about the evolution of these events. When they're actually far apart, you can do sort of cause and effect. What happens here and then how does it cause something to happen further in? So that you know, we'll be doing a full range of science as the separation of the two spacecraft changes. And the reason you want identical, you, you, know, you don't want a kind of mother-daughter, but you do want identical mm -hmm. twins, mm -hmm. is that you really do want to be using the same instruments to make sure that you, know, you are studying the science and you're not just seeing something that's changed because you're using a different instrument to sense it. Now, what are some of the, of the major tests that you have to undergo to actually uh, rate this spacecraft as space uh, ready? It starts at the, at the component level, really the piece part level. We build up the boxes. As the boxes go through their integration, we do a lot of electronic testing on the electronic boxes to make sure they're functionally working the way they should. And then we do a lot of testing over temperature, so the absolute hottest and absolute coldest that um, spacecraft will ever see and that those boxes will ever see, we make sure everything works at those temperature extremes. We need to go through vibration testing on all of those. But we also do a lot of testing, functional testing, to make sure that, for example, when we're trying to control the spacecraft with thrusters, that when we command this set of thrusters to come on, that's the right set of thrusters right, that comes right. on. And that when the spacecraft is sensing where it is, it's sensing where the sun is, that it actually knows that up is up and down is right. down. So phasing tests and alignment tests right. are, are a big part of it as well. Now, you, you talked about them being at different distances uh, during the mission. How, how does that work? They actually trail one another and we will launch them and the apogees or the furthest point away from the Earth that they will see are slightly different. One is just a little bit closer to the Earth than the other. So that means that one will orbit faster. So they will start off close together and then this one will gradually drift away and then it will catch up and then it will go around again. So you actually, by plan, are getting those different distances. Oh, it is all, yeah. yes, it's carefully planned uh, to do awesome. that. In a perfect world, we would see a fabulous storm every day, yeah. but you know, obviously that's not gonna happen. So we try and, and design the mission. So we move around um, with enough quickness that we can be in all places to see storms, but also not so quickly that you're just missing things in, in certain target regions. Well, I think this is an absolutely key mission and, and not only all the science you're gonna get, but also in promoting uh, magnetospherence uh, use among the scientific community. I really think you need to consider uh, the, the new names, or at least unofficially. I will certainly consider it, but oh, I promise great. that. Great. Awesome. You're watching NASA Edge, an inside and outside look at all things NASA. And before we go, could I have a pound of sliced turkey? I don't think I'm qualified to operate the slicer. <laughs> I, I can hand it out, but I can't cut it. Okay. <laughs>